Hi, and thanks so much for joining us. Um, I am, for description purposes, I am Laura Brody, the curator, one of the main curators of Opulent Mobility. And I'm a Caucasian woman, middle-aged, brown hair, uh, with sitting in front of a very full bookshelf. And welcome, Austin. Hi, my name is Austin Levetkin. I'm one of the artists participating in Opulent Mobility. Um, for description purposes, I am a 27-year-old white male sitting in my living room. Um, and I've got my service dog next to me in the corner. So how did you find out about Opulent Mobility in the first place? Because you've worked with me before for one show. So two I, shows. I, two I shows now. I've stuff on Instagram, and I'd also, I've been active with, with the Monrovia Association of Fine Artists. I found mm -hmm. out about shows going on in Monrovia, and previously there, I believe, often in Billy in past years had taken place in the city I live in. So I wanted to get involved in past years, but this is the first year I've been able to participate and get a piece together for the show. I'm really excited about that. That's really cool. How long have you been doing stuff with Monrovia? Um, I moved here January 2020, so it's it was a, a very interesting time to move here. But I got involved yeah. with Norway Association of Fine Artists, started showing locally. Um, I also show with several galleries, including Tag Gallery, um, and um, Art Lounge Collective. Nice. How did you get involved with them? Um, so I, both of those are are juries. You kind of send an application work on a body of work and kind of submit that and the galleries review it. Um, my journey with art actually started before I even got here back when I was in Florida. My mother mm. was a huge influence in my artwork. Um, we did a lot of art therapy together um, that kind of helped me open up, learn to communicate through art, really use art as a tool of therapy. And I've always really relied on art to that extent. That's really wonderful. Uh, what did you get started in art therapy? Was that something she had been doing? My mom previously had worked with autistic adults and she previously was an, uh, an artist, but she mm. just started with me and there was a art teacher we worked with that she kind of guided the lessons with. Um, so we, that was a huge help, um, different stage of my life. Um, and art has always really been there for me through my, through everything. That's wonderful. What first started calling to you that made you want to start making art? See, it wasn't really necessarily a choice. Um, I have something called synesthesia where mm -hmm. I see these colors around me, where it's a mix of my brain chemistry and my emotions that kind of get put into my environment. So anything that's like a, a white surface or a wall gets replaced by all these colors and all these details that really re reflect my own brain chemistry and my own emotions. So when I was a young child, I was really surrounded by all these really intense emotions that I couldn't make sense of. I didn't really have a lot of control of my emotions at early stage. So I think part of learning control that was also exploring those colors through art and learning to process them through art. It's a great way to do that, to just give them a place. For sure. How did they first start taking form? Like, who are you? It's, it's always been there. Um, It wasn't in the early parts restricted to walls. It, it, when I when I would tantrum as a, as a young child, it would take over my entire vision, basically. So wow. it's kind of a back loop. But um. A, as I've gotten more control over, as I've grown older, it's it's more so restricted just to the environment. The work that I've seen of yours has primarily been based on people. Um, yes. Um, is that I most of your interest? Not necessarily. I do some figurative. I do some abstract. I think the, the core guiding principle is my use of color. Uh, I really mm -hmm. try and have a signature use of color where people see my colors and immediately know it's one of my pieces and my colors all come from my synesthesia and they also I think lend themselves to the world of psychedelics as well people see my colors and very much associate them with their experiences in psychedelics I was going to share the piece that you're going putting into yep. the show so this was a self-portrait I did um I kind of there I was kind of tr trying to look at all these colors kind of exploding out from my own sort of mind in a way and blooming outwards. Um, I have details like the numbers on one side and where the colors and shapes on the other. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, the whole sort of brain sort of manifesting together. Um, but really was a sort of self-portrait about this, um, this, this sort of explosion of creative force that kind of comes from within. And I really tie that to my autism. I view my autism when I see it with my synesthesia as this very sort of organizing principle that kind of segments things and organizes and trend puts them into more of a high contrast sort of perspective versus, you know, you think of 
you know, think of emotions more about a gradient. It tries to make some more extremes, more black and white. Um, so I think I try to tr sort of represent how it kind of segments some of my emotions in that way. Um, represent how that kind of that creative force I, I do tie to my autism, the way I'm kind of inspired creatively and the way I'm sort of driven creatively. Mm. So what are the mediums that you prefer? Sure. Um, I do a mix between mixed media painting and digital art as well as video um, and augmented reality. So a lot of my pieces, I will start with uh, a digital collage that I'll make on combining previous paintings I've done, photographs I've taken. This is a selfie of mine. I sort of combine it all together to create these collages. Um, and then on top of that, I will usually print it on a canvas and, pr and paint on it. And that sort of evolves the style with each one of these paintings to kind of turn into the next sort of iteration of the piece and kind of evolves between the digital and the painted form. And I kind of choose to evolve my style that way, going back and forth. And, um, this piece uh, combined several paintings of mine and was inspired by some pieces I've done previously. I um, actually have one of this piece I can show you if you want to see. I would love to see. Thanks. So this was sort of a psychedelic Statue of Liberty. It was a collaboration with this pop artist I worked with. Okay. And we kind of evolved my style where I did the base piece. And I looked at his use of mixed media. I was really inspired by it. But this is one of the first pieces where I really had this balance of the white negative space with the uh, high contrast colors. Mm -hmm. This was a big inspiration carrying over to the this uh, portrait as well, trying to recreate the style in my own sort of style to carry it over and create a self-portrait. Got it. You know, because it's got a really op art kind of feel to it. The uh, the portrait that you have done, it's got sort of a Peter Max kind of feel. That, sure. um, or are there different artists that you view as like being inspirations? Um, I think, you know, Lisa Frank, um, you, know, you see yourself very commercial, but I think that's some of an inspiration as well. You know, it works. There are a lot of people who are really big fans of Lisa Frank. <laughs> you know, the, they still have the unicorns. You know, this is these are beautiful pieces. What made you think about uh, incorporating digital and video into the pieces? Sure. Um, I mean, my I started doing more physical painting, learning more traditional art, but there was there's limits with what I can envision creatively and the speed my sort of brain works at with what I can do physically. So I think you know digital helps me work more at the speed of what I can think through things, um, and then as my skills have grown as an artist, I'm able to take pieces and recombine them with my my skills as a painter and bring them back and create more uh, mixed media compositions that I can do at my own sort of pace now that I've got the kind of foundation in place. Nice. So do you make the painting first and then incorporate the video? How do you do that? So usually um, there's multiple stages. So I'll have a mm -hmm. piece like this that's at this stage. And I'll take a high quality photo or scan of it. Then I'll start animating a, a video on top of that, adding video elements, animation to it. Sometimes I'll use AI to create certain effects on the piece. Mm -hmm. um, then I will have that animation played. Usually when people scan it with an app, they're able to, to interact with it and see the animation come off the piece. Nice. You were saying that you're actually trying to work it so it doesn't have to use an app now. Right. So this, I, my own experience with gallery shows has been a lot of people really are drawn to the piece, but they're not taking that step forward to interact with the actual animation. Yeah. Um, so I think I, I'm trying to do for this show an example of a pure video piece where I'm going to have a TV screen that's going to be framed and it's going to be playing the video piece that people will be able to see the video just moving constantly. Yeah. One thing I think will also be more accessible, I think there's definitely some accessibility challenges using an app um, for a lot of factors. And I think this kind of plays into that, um, trying to trying a new format and with it, with this show as an opportunity to really test it out and see how accessible this new format is. I think it will be great. It'll be really interesting because, yeah, sometimes people, when they're having to interact with an app, sometimes they do it, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes they won't want to deal with it. Um, and it, they're just not getting the full experience. So this will be a really nice way to uh, interact with a work. Sure, I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, that'll be neat. Because um, I had another artist who a lot of their work is done online and part of the experience that is intended is that feeling of what it's like when you just come across it online. Is that something that you've ever done? Sure, uh, I've definitely create experiences through social media and Instagram mm -hmm. 
I put them in see these video pieces, but I think there there's limitations with being purely as a digital artist where I try to really show my skills as a painter with a lot of my canvases as well and show that I can paint, create these pieces on that sort of fine art level. Yeah. I think I'm limited by in the digital space. No, I mean, there's only so much you can do. And honestly, in screens, there's only so much of a resolution you're going to get. So you're really not finding all the fine details. Mm. I think even beyond that, there's there's an element of originality where I think a painted piece can be viewed more as a one of one, has more value, mm, more mm, value mm, got it. in the art space. I think that's why I really try to create with all my pieces is to add that unique element to each one with the physical. And that's why I've really been relying on the and Trally as an enhancement versus these physical pieces. Because it digital, as I said, you know, it's limited, um, but it still doesn't necessarily have that same fine art connotation of value. Yeah, and it's interesting. I mean, if you start thinking of it in terms of if somebody is purchasing your piece, are they purchasing part of the app? Are they, you know, how are you doing that? How are you going to manage right. that? Even beyond that, and you know, I had conversations with the company behind the app recently. I was talking to them about, you know, is the, is this app going to be available forever? How do I guarantee with a sale that people can continually interact with the painting? Yeah, those were those were unique questions that kind of tie into it because art has that kind of permanent value, and that's something that you limit yourself with in the digital in the digital space. Yeah, because those change all the time. Is one of those things like okay, it's not that you can't still, for example, access a floppy disk, but it's going to be more difficult. Like, I mean, so even. Even stuff like Instagram in 50 years, it might not be around. Like Yeah, easily. It's going to be hard to tell what that format's going to be and how it's going to work. So that's going to be really interesting to see. Huh. Have, is that something been, you've been interested in trying to develop as well? You know, I've I've had ideas about the idea of trying to create some sort of like perpetual license with the app, like certain pieces where you could purchase a license for like 20 years. Mm. But I think part of that's going to be relying on sort of developing my own tools. And I think that's yeah. in the space to have those sort of digital tools available in a finer context with, you know, really a guarantee that these digital experiences will be available for that period of time. What an interesting thing to think about. I, didn't, I, I mean, I think any artist has some thoughts about what the longevity of their pieces are going to be. But this is a whole different realm of how that's going to work. And that's that's the the blend between the traditional art space and the digital space. There's, there, you know, you look at art from hundreds of years ago, and it has immense value. And the context people put on art is that they expect that from every piece. I think it's it's hard to expect that with a lot of these digital art pieces, photos will fade, prints will fade. They, you know, they're not they're not being made with these long lasting materials. Yeah. So many of the things already have statues have crumbled oil paints fade and all of this is innately time bound you know but you try to see and make it last as long Still as you can for sure hmm. that's just it's really fascinating stuff what got you excited with ai so um by the day i'm a software engineer i work in mm -hmm. Arizona and I'm an AI machine learning computer vision specialist. So this is kind of the area I work in, the area I develop tools in, and I've also developed several accessibility tools. Accessibility tools are part of things like Google Maps uh, to make mm -hmm. navigation more accessible. Um, but a lot of my work um, has been in that realm of AI technology. Now I'm curious, what are you doing to make Google Maps more accessible? This is a project I actually did in college that got incorporated into Google Maps where I designed a tool that gave directions in a visual format, like turn right when you see CVS, turn left at the 7-Eleven, which gotcha. not a single app had done at the time. Um, it was a model that, for my own experience, made directions more accessible and easier yes. to understand. And that was something that I felt was missing a lot of the apps where they were strictly limited by their developers developing things very numerically, turn right 500 feet, turn left to the so-so street name. They were their quantitative versus qualitative. And that I think limited their audience and the audience was limited by the, the developers of the apps. Um, so I focused on trying to create a more accessible model for the experience. Nice. Do you feel like you're doing a little bit of something like that with your own artwork? 
I think so. I think I have, I've had several concepts that I've tested out that are, are in development um, that have tried to make art more accessible. Um, I have a piece, I believe, at the Los Angeles Center for the Blind that is interactive and you can touch with it and interact with sort of um, a braille poem on it. That was a the collaboration I worked on with other artists as well. Um, but I think with my own art, I've tried to, I'm trying to experiment with the digital tools, trying to find the right medium that is the foundation to really make those digital tools accessible. And that comes oh. in a lot of formats. Um, yeah, what kinds of formats are you wanting? Sure. One thing I've been experimenting with is translating colors to sound. Um, Ooh, interesting. That was, that's been an ongoing project, even going back to college, where I've experimented with turning the colors people interact with are looking at to a combination of string instruments so they can hear colors. Um, Neat. I think people were able to pass a colorblind test when they were colorblind. Mm -hmm. And that was a, a cool project. It's just the, the format has to be right for that because currently examples are, you know, using a touch screen, which is very small, um, or something like eye tracking, which is not accurate enough to really make the, the app functional in a, in a, in a public space. Hmm. All right, but something that certainly is a work in progress. For sure. Neat. I know, that's, that's kind of exciting, right? To have it always be in flux and new things in process. For sure. I, I really try, I'm trying to be an innovator in this space, I'm trying to be known as one of the, not only the top artists with the disability, with autism, but also an artist who's trying to develop tools that make art for everyone more accessible. Thank you again so much for being part of this. Um, I was trying to try to see if I can share your work from the uh, from the goddesses show that. Um, yeah, I would love to show that off. Yeah, Austin has been in a couple of shows I did. The piece that he had in and Enter the Goddesses, which was when it was about interpreting the goddess in all of her various forms. So here we go. So this was a mixed media piece I made, where it's a combination of a digital painting collage of my own sort of abstract pieces I did and painting as well to kind of create this overall composition. It was also part of an ongoing series of tarot deck cards that I, this was the high priestess card and I'm working on a psychedelic tarot deck. Fun. That'll be great. I'm just was looking at and listening to you talk about your, some of your ideas and the idea of translating those colors to sound would be really fascinating. Because this, to me, feels like an explosion. You know. I think that's also that's always another challenge I had with the format of sound. People think of a piece like this, you want an overall composition and a logic sort of translating the, the overall flow of the piece versus the models I'd been working on were a similar version where people were their own guide where they looked at specific colors and they would interact in those colors. As we turn to the the overall challenge of creating an overall musical composition out of a piece, I think, is a much more challenging problem that's still in progress. I would think so, because I, what kind of emotion tracking are you trying to do? What kind of color tracking, and where do you start? How do you figure that? It'll be really interesting. You know, because this piece in person, you don't really get that from here. Has little bits attached onto it all over. What kinds yeah, of was, uh, I I taken one of my abstract prints and I used that and cut that up and used it as a collage. Um, so I was using my own abstract mix piece for the mixed media elements, kind that of makes sense. kind of using the colors consistently. That makes sense, and then it works within the color range of your world, for sure. Because it, it looks like I, from the pieces that I have seen. Um, that looks like more of your color range. That's your palette. Yeah. So how can people find you? For sure. Um, you can find me on Instagram. Um, my username is Boca Aust, all one word, B-O-C-A-A-U-S-T. Um, and you can also find me uh, on my website, bocaost.com. Um, if anyone's interested in reaching out to me, you can reach out to me through the links on my Instagram as well or message me there. Perfect. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you're going to get so to much. be part of the show. I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you so much.